Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It is a real pleasure and honor to serve as your moderator for tonight's discussion and to join such a passionate and informed group of urbanists. My job tonight is really quite simple, to keep us focused on the big question. What were the defining moments, decisions, actions, and events in planning and development in Vancouver in 2017, or in 2017, that could prove to be transformative in how Vancouver evolves? As Marta and Jennifer outlined, tonight Tonight's discussion is the final step in a process of gathering information and community input. And the Com Planning Commission's chronology team will sort through all of these reflections and ideas, and the final selected 2017 milestone contenders will be published online. And, but not finalized for five years. So this really is a long, long process. Um, so here's how the evening will go. I'll introduce our panelists. Each will have four or five minutes to speak to those contenders or to talk about how significant 2017 was from their perspective or basically just to offer some opening remarks. We'll have a discussion among the panelists and then we'll open up the floor and invite your questions uh, and comments. So we have an extraordinary group of people with us tonight as panelists, a former politician, a a community activist, an academic, and an architect. So what I'll do is as I, as I intr um, uh, introduce our speakers, I'll invite them to come up and join me on the stage. Melody Ma is a neighborhood advocate for Vancouver's Chinatown. Come on up. <laughs> Leading a campaign. <laughs> Leading a campaign called Save Vancouver, China, Save Chinatown YVR, she has been advocating for better municipal urban planning policy and thoughtful development through Chinatown and more recently across Greater Vancouver, while inspiring Vancouverites to recognize the importance of the historic area to both our collective history and its current residents. She is also an active writer on urban issues, and her opinion editorials have appeared in the Vancouver Sun and the Globe and Mail. Melody co-founded the Young Patrons Group for Ballet BC and was the local Vancouver co-chair and national co-chair of business for the arts arts scene. In 2015, Melody organized the Hour of Code event in BC as part of the global movement to teach young people coding skills, working with the provincial government, BC Teachers Federation, and industry to bring coding into BC schools. Outside of her advocacy work, Melody is a software product marketer and web developer. She was born and raised in Vancouver. Welcome. <laughs> Dr. Paul Kershaw. One up. It is one of Canada's leading thinkers about generational equity. He's a tenured professor at the University of British Columbia, public speaker, regular media contributor, and founder of Generation Squeeze, a voice for younger Canadians in politics and the market supported by cutting edge research. In 2017, Paul and his Generation Squeeze colleagues received the award for BC's affordable housing champion from the Provincial Housing Coalition. At UBC, Dr. Paul Kershaw is a pro policy professor in the School of Population and Public Health and is a member of the Human Early Learning partnership. In 2016, he received the award for Academic of the Year and the, from the Confederation of University Faculty Associations of BC and was twice honored by the Canadian Political Science Association with national prizes for his research. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Uri Scott. A Clicho Dene architect, originally from the Northwest Territories, is driven to resolve prevalent yet often unaddressed design issues that face Indigenous people. As a designer, she looks to develop a modern design language to react and respond to contemporary First Nations culture. She is passionate about sustainable architecture and sees it as honoring her role as, the, as a steward of the land. Her recent work with urban arts architecture includes an award-winning concept for a net-zero mixed-use development in Seattle that incorporates some renewable energy strategies and intensive vertical farming. Uri is an active member of the Indigenous Task Force of the Royal Architectural Institute of BC. Welcome. If you, if you hear me pause when I read these biographies or, or just take a moment, it's because I really want to say, that is so cool. <laughs> and finally, Gord Price. Gord was the director of the city program at Simon Fraser University until last October and is now a fellow with the SFU Center for Dialogue. In 2002, he finished his sixth term as a city councillor in Vancouver, BC. He also served on the board of the Greater Vancouver Regional District and was appointed to the first board of, Greater, of, of the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority, now TransLink, in 1989. He also blogs on urban issues and transportation with a focus on Vancouver at price tags. Welcome, Gordon. So 
So I will now ask each of the panelists for their opening remarks on the watershed moments in planning and development that might just possibly change how Vancouver evolves. How significant was 2017? So I, will, I think I'll start with Melody and we'll work on So first of all, I want to say how privileged I feel to be on this panel today because I've only been involved in this urban planning discussion for Vancouver for maybe about a year and a little bit. And that has been through my advocacy for Chinatown and realizing the necessity to preserve, protect, and progress this gem of a neighborhood in our city. I remember one of the first interviews I did what, about my advocacy for Chinatown last year. And um, I said, as a born bred Vancouverite, I see Chinatown and what's happening there as sort of this microcosm of what's happening in Vancouver. And there's so ma many parallels, especially in 2017. So some of the parallels include you know, the real estate market pressures in Chinatown is very pronounced, and of course, in Vancouver. Um, the notion of speculation um, in Chinatown, some properties stay empty and get flipped, not once, twice, but three times. We're seeing that in the rest of Vancouver. Um, also, density, the fact that we have all the supply that has been built in Chinatown, but who's the density for? I think that's a question uh, that we are asking in Vancouver and whether that density is for people with local incomes in the neighborhood or across Vancouver. Um, we're seeing small businesses close, changing demographies. It's really a reflection of how Chinatown um, is this microcosm of what's happening in Vancouver. And beyond all of the issues, we also see in 2017 was the year, and it was one of the milestones, was the year that uh, politicians and the government realize, hey, wait, maybe what we've been doing in Chinatown isn't quite the right thing. Maybe this residential intensification to revitalize Chinatown has re resulted in economic displacement and gentrification of the neighborhood, and that we need to stop and step back and reevaluate how we want to proceed. And I see that happening for Vancouver too. 2017 was the year that finally the government acknowledged that we have issues beyond not enough supply and that we need to step back and take a housing reset of what is going on in Vancouver. So a ton of parallels. Um, in terms of the milestones, the top three that I thought uh, were important, of course, I'm, I'm a bit biased. Uh, the, my top two will be the Chinatown ones. And I guess I'm not that biased because uh, of the survey, in the survey that the Planning Commission issued to about 80 people, maybe some of you in the room has um, uh, filled it in, uh, the Chinatown one was, the two were in the top four. So I'm not the only one who thinks that Chinatown is important in Vancouver. Uh, so the top two for Chinatown is one, the 105 Kiefer development permit being rejected uh, by the development permit board. I know in the planning commission sheets it says that this is the first development permit that was rejected ever, but I believe it's only the last decade. Uh, but it was also rejected, the rezoning was rejected uh, by city council a few months before, and I remember going to an event at the Museum of Vancouver and seeing photos of us celebrating the rejection. Um, so it was already in the history of Vancouver in the Museum of Vancouver. I was wowed by that. I guess the 105 Kiefer development permit rejection um, really signifies, I guess, next step on when developers want to build in heritage areas, what they need to look for, and what does that mean. The second uh, milestone that I thought was important was, again, another Chinatown one about the zoning changes. Um, the city initially wanted to double down on the zoning changes and double down on the rezoning and wanted to put in these gigantic 200 feet uh, 
uh, buildings, um, that would have just decimated Chinatown. And so then we made a whole ruckus about it. They stepped back and said, well, maybe that's not the right thing. Maybe we should respect the character of Chinatown and instead encourage people to have more fine-grained, small-lot developments. Um, and so that was a turning point in realizing what is the importance of Chinatown in Vancouver and why do we need to preserve this important heritage area? The third milestone that I thought was important, I, I'm not going to say the housing reset strategy because I feel like some other folks on this panel might mention it. Uh, as you know from my biography, I'm, I'm, I work in the tech industry and I actually worked out of the False Creek Flats area for about three years. Um, so the False Creek Flats area is, seems like an innovation district that the city wants to put in. And so I'm interested in how that will evolve as an innovation district and what it means for this so-called innovation economy that we have or want to create in Vancouver. So I'm going to just leave it at that right now, and hopefully we'll have uh, uh, more discussion about each of these milestones as we progress. Thank you. Yes. Well, let me carry on from there. Also acknowledging thank you for the invitation to be part of the panel. It's a, a real privilege. I struggled with the question, was 2017 transformative? I struggled because the scale of the challenges facing our city especially on the unaffordability front, is so massive. I didn't want to answer the question, yeah, it was transformative, and have people walk away thinking, we solved it. <laughs> but if transformative means, did we pave the way, did we lay some groundwork for change that's going to happen in the years ahead that can actually give, in particular, a younger demographic a glimmer of hope that they might be able to make a home here in the way that their parents did uh, or when their parents immigrated here, they wanted to be available to them. And I think that 2017 does offer that glimmer of hope. And in that regard, it is transformative. Because we saw in 2017 our municipal legislators and their uh, city planners take more seriously the unaffordability challenges than we have seen in years past. And I will go out on a limb to say we now in this city have the boldest housing strategy of any city in the country. But before you think that's too successful, you need to know Canada has really lousy housing policy <laughs> in most of the country. And just to put that in context, when my mom was a young woman in this city four decades ago, starting out, it took the typical 25 to 34 year olds about five to six years to save a 20% down payment on an average priced home in this city, in this province, and in this country. But if you flash forward to today, it now takes 13 years for that same young person across the country to save that 20% down payment, signaling that cities across the country have to some degree lost control of home prices relative to their earnings. No more so than in beautiful British Columbia, no more so than where we meet today. So it is appropriate that we now have the boldest housing strategy of any city. But the devil will be in the details of its implementation, and we need to really focus on that. So there are a few things I'd like to highlight from that housing strategy, which, by the way, was ranked number one in terms of milestones. But I think it's too broad a thing to be counted as a milestone itself. It has a number of important details. One of the most important, and it's going to be an interesting conversation about the supply side focus on you know, how do we rein in home prices in this city, because supply does matter. Prices are the interaction of supply and demand. The problem is so urgent in this city, we can't just say, I want to focus on some parts, of the, some tools in the toolbox at the exclusion of the others. We just need to grab every tool in the toolbox and start using them. And so supply has some important pieces, especially in a city where land use over the last decades has resulted in 80% of the land effectively being reserved for one third of the people. Let me say that again, 80% of Vancouver's land houses one third of its citizens. That land use strategy raises a range of questions about inequality, and it certainly is contributing to higher home prices because it restricts supply. 
while we're tackling that, and this new housing strategy lays the groundwork to tackle that in ways we have not seen before, we do need to talk about reducing harmful kinds of demand. And so 2017 was the year that we implemented, for the first time ever, in this country, an empty homes tax. I think it was a milestone identified in 2016, but it got implemented in 2017, and it's consistent with the principle of homes first. Let's remember that the primary purpose of our real estate market has to be the efficient supply of suitable homes that are in reach for what typical people earn. If you can make a return on a real estate investment, that's fabulous. But those returns now need to be a secondary consideration to first keeping home prices in reach. And an empty homes tax is a beautiful way to signal, hey, if you're purchasing a home for a reason other than to rent out to someone who lives and works here or to live in yourself, then you're clearly not treating it as a home. You're treating it as an investment. And so that was a lovely uh, step forward, as were the regulations on short-term rentals. I think it's very in keeping with that homes first principle. So these are two things that have happened at the city level that I believe will be milestones five years hence. But I am, I think, relatively well known for saying I'm a municipal skeptic. There's only so much that municipalities can do to change the cities in which we live because they're the daughters of senior levels of government and most of the power uh, resides with those senior levels of government. So there are two other milestones that I just wish to highlight. The next would be a detail in our housing strategy, a detail where the city asked the senior levels of government to join with them in a conversation about how do we tax housing wealth going forward? This is an important question for our city. We are a city of the global elite now. Oftentimes we think we're the city of the global elite because many global elite focus, folks have come from other places to sort of use our real estate market to park their money. But we're a city of the global elite. You need one million Canadian dollars to be part of the global 1% in wealth. We have many people who grew up as hardworking nurses and bus drivers and service providers who bought their homes when my mom was a young woman who are now the global 1%. Uh-huh. <laughs> and this housing strategy invites us to have that conversation and say our incomes are not growing very fast and yet we tax that a lot. Wealth and housing is growing more than, well at least home prices are growing more than people might want, but we tax that very little. Here's a frightening stat. I, I must be almost out of time. Today, across the country, principal residences equal, have more value in them to the tune of $2.6 trillion from coast to coast. But as a country on an annual basis in municipal property taxation, we collect $4 billion less today than we did when my mom was a young woman, once you adjust for inflation. That is an interesting stat. And my last milestone, talking about taxation of taxation of housing wealth at senior levels of government, takes me to one other thing I think senior levels of government can do that the city's been calling for so long. Housing is what's driving unaffordability in this city. It's going to be hard to fix. We're not going to bring it back to what it looked like when my mom was a young woman. But there are other costs that are major costs in people's lives, especially young people trying to make a family here. Things like childcare. And childcare does add up to another rent size payment or another mortgage size payment. And for years, the city has been calling on senior levels of government to implement a plan to bring down the cost of childcare. I'm proud that my lab and team members have been involved in a $10 a day childcare plan recommended for some time. And in this calendar year, that plan was adopted by a political party at the provincial level, and the party with which it is now in a coalition-like government of sort also committed similar levels of funding to bring down the cost of childcare so it's, another, it's no longer another rent or mortgage size payment. That will be, if it comes to fruition in a budget in 14 days, actually be a real milestone for our city. Dante, Sinana ke na wunda, uri siye, klinsho goti nongo tsoete. So uh, I start off by saying um, it warms my heart to be sitting amongst you, um, other panelists, and also amongst the crowd today. Um, uh, as you might have experienced with indigenous people, it's important for us to introduce ourselves in our own language, to state our nation, so I'm Klincho, and also um, to state our family connections. And this is about placing ourselves in our community um, and providing context um, for who we are and, and how we fit within that community. Um, so again, um, 
Sinana Kina Wunda. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, for me, as a resident of the downtown east side, um, I am inundated daily with the sound of sirens. Um, I have two small children, a, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, um, and they go to school um, here in the downtown east side. Um, and the children in our building um, learn about needles, about condoms, and about cigarettes. For us, um, the most important thing for them to know about is the needles, because they're everywhere. And one thing that is not on the list, and I think maybe this is a debate for tonight, um, is the fentanyl crisis, the overdose crisis that's happening. Um, the third Wednesday of every month is Welfare Wednesday. I'm very familiar with this day because my son's daycare is closed the third Monday, uh, third Wednesday of every month. And um, so this, this, this day is traumatic and it's significant. The sound on the streets um, of the sirens, the wails of the people, and the, the sight of people passing out and, 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 and in states of distress is traumatic for me, it's traumatic for my children, but it's also traumatic for our first responders and our healthcare workers. It's significant. And to argue that this is not a planning crisis, um, I think is really um, taking away some of the responsibility that our city has in this, um, in this crisis. Um, drug harm reduction sites, exist in our city, we need more. There are all kinds of articles out there about how the overdose crisis isn't only affecting the residents of the downtown east side. It's not a class issue. But where are all the drug reduction sites? They're all in the downtown east side. Why aren't there sites all over our city? We need to see this happening everywhere. That's a planning issue. That's a city-wide issue. There's so many parts of it um, that can be addressed. If you think about all of the different policies that we have in our city, from um, resiliency to healthy city strategies, these, these, all of these different policies should be addressing and should be working to solve this um, significant crisis. Um, I read an article where, on average, in 2017, seven people died from the overdose crisis. Seven people per week. That's a lot of people. And that doesn't include all of the people who were saved in that week, who had first responders giving them um, naloxone. They had family members. They had friends. So the crisis is very significant, and it's not on our list. And I think that's something um, that needs to be addressed. The housing strategy, um, for me, is um, an exciting opportunity to, to imagine a path forward. Um, as, as a young mother, as a young professional, um, I would like to imagine myself and my children in this city for years and years to come. But I can't, I can't imagine where I'm going to be um, and how I'm going to manage to stay here because it's completely unaffordable. The housing strategy gives me a little bit of hope. As an urban Aboriginal, it also gives me a little bit of hope because there's some directions in that housing strategy that are directed towards um, addressing the, the needs of the urban Aboriginal families, the family structures, um, providing places for intergenerational housing, providing places for communities to come together. and. Um, while the housing strategy doesn't answer all of these questions, it begins to set up a path forward. And I think that path forward and suggestions on how we might address these things in the right way, how we might open the discussion without rushing to answers, I think is actually the right response. You can't just provide answers without having a proper conversation about how to do it properly. And in terms of the urban Aboriginal, response. I think that path forward requires some discussion and um, it requires a bit of consultation. So I'm, I'm pleased that there's still a bit of time to consider what that path forward might be. And I look forward to being part of that discussion and, and um, 
part of finding what those solutions are. And then the third one I wanted to highlight was uh, the False Creek Flats, the amount of density that they're um, suggesting in the area, kind of the vision forward. Um, if you think about how our city changed and the skyline changed, um, places like um, Ye Yale Town, it was a huge change from what it was to what it is today. And I imagine um, the False Creek Flats, um, if you think about it in 30 years, it'll be nothing like it is today. And I, I hope that we're able to find some good, um, some good path forward, um, but I think they'll I think it'll be significant the, the way that it'll change. Thank you. Good on the VCPC for doing this. Three years now, this is only going to get better. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I am honored to be able to speak to this. I'm going to choose, indeed, uh, five, if I can, uh, of the already identified significant milestones and discuss this difficulty that you have in trying to forecast whether something is transformative through a future lens. Only the future gets to decide. So some of this indeed may be transformative, some in fact may not. I'll discuss both of them. But the first though I would put uh, with Nani on uh, what I do think was truly something that we won't know the results of, but we can tell that they're going to be in some way significant. And that was a decision of the Development Permit Board on the Kiefer Street application, not because of the application, but for what it may mean for the Development Permit Board. Now this would take another five minutes just to get into some of the backstory on that. Development Permit Board comes out of the Team Spaxman era, and it did two key things. It depoliticized the approval of development permits. Not zoning, not policy, but politicians were not the ones to approve a development permit under existing zoning. Right. That went to staff committees, advisory groups, and basically was a negotiated process using a discretionary bylaw that relied on trust. The developer could come knowing it was going to be a rigorous process. In fact, if you didn't go through it, you probably wouldn't be able to proceed to get approval. But if you did, you had a reasonable expectation, the reason why there have been so few rep uh, refusals, that by and large, except for some prior two conditions, you would get that permit. If instead you now believe you're in a situation where regardless of the negotiation you do and the extensiveness of the process, at the last minute, something that wasn't seriously entered into the discussion or negotiated, for which you really don't understand anyway, is part of the way that the city now does business, the potential for undermining the trust and the legitimacy and potentially even the legal validity of the development permit board would fundamentally change how we do business in this city. I think it was the wrong decision because I believe that if the Development Permit Board, after hearing the community, realized that this was essentially a political decision, they should have, as they can, refer it to council. The council hears the community. The council gives their advice. It goes back to the Development Permit Board, and you can imagine they take that very seriously, council's opinion, but they didn't do that. And instead, we now have a situation where cultural significance is part of what it means to get a development permit in this city, and no one really knows what that means. So this is to be discussed, and the discussion, I think, I fear, may turn out to be a legal one. The other really significant change here is, if I understand it correctly, was not so much the housing policy report, which I thought was groundbreaking. I was astonished it got so little coverage. Just amazing. But within it, uh, the change, let me read it, approved a program to transform, transform low density neighborhoods by allowing denser and more affordable housing forms, multiple dwelling units, du duplexes, triplexes, etc. Now, this suggests a change in scale and character a change in scale and character. And I may be corrected, but I can't think of an existing community in this city that has ever accepted that, except on industrial lands. Collingwood Village, Arbutus Gardens, Fraser Lands. But I can't think of a community, particularly one that is rooted in the garden city typology, the iconic nature of this city, the single family house, the front yard, the backyard, 
residential streets. This is who we are. That's our identity. And this proposes to change the scale and character. Now, we'll see what happens. Because even in Chinatown, even in the West End, any neighborhood, once you actually get down <laughs> to making those changes, of change scale and character, now you're into it. And as Paul has mentioned, the imperative is greater than ever. 30% of people on 80% of the land, not quite sure if that's right, but we have no doubt that the nature of the city, if it continues in its current form, is not going to be able to address the most critical and outstanding issue. So lots of <laughs> future talk to come on that. One that might not mean very much, but which struck me as being really quite significant, because it certainly wouldn't have been something we would have done back <laughs> in my day, uh, the, uh, to give the city engineer authority, quote, to facilitate more efficient delivery of important sustainable transportation and safety improvements. <laughs> Who could be against that? <laughs> to facilitate more efficient delivery. Oh, man. This shows I've been on council for a long time. Those words come up, and I think right away, I want to know a lot more about what that means. Now, this might just work out fine. It might be inconsequential. The engineers argue it's really not much different than we normally do business. But embedded within it is the potential for, well, some interesting transformative change. So we'll see how that plays out. One that's significant uh, uh, that I thought was an indicator of how outlying ideas, things that were discussed maybe a decade or two ago, but which were considered pretty extreme, have now become mainstream. And nothing to me illustrates that more than a new parking strategy for the West End based on market pricing from $72 to 300 and something. I mean, the number is breathtaking just on that alone. But the fact that it went through was, uh, they handled it very, very well. Grandfathered everyone who already has a parking permit. But that was really a significant step because whether you're talking about parking in the West End or mobility pricing throughout Metro, this is no question where the future is going, but how we get there is going to be a fascinating discussion. And that was a first early step. Two that might matter a lot, one's already been mentioned, the False Creek Flats and uh, the new zoning that will be involved there. This is truly significant. You've covered it well. I won't go back into that. Uh, but it does seem to me that this question of what a resilient city is and whether the new resilience officer really is capable of identifying ways to ensure that new systems have the capacity to endure and even thrive in the face of shocks and stresses, not only from natural disasters, but also from adverse socioeconomic trends. Okay, that's the way we <laughs> they write stuff. Uh, and it's kind of bloodless. But if it's true, if we really now are seriously going to take on this question of chaos, whether for the first time it is possible to talk about apocalypse in the context of planning strategy, that sounds a bit much, doesn't it? Apocalypse, the end of civilization as we know it. It's on the table. And now we're suggesting a process by which we're going to incorporate that thinking into planning strategy. Yeah, that's transformative. That's through a future lens. And again, we'll see where this goes. Now, I think I've covered off most of that. And I am going to talk about the, uh, the elephant, the missing the thing that was missing the most, and it's already been touched on. Uh, and it is a failure of the entire political class that they could not find a way to talk about that question, questions and implications that everybody else was talking about. Whether you were dealing with affordability and fairness, who is this city for? Whether you are dealing with questions about who is coming here and how do they get their money and what are they doing and what's the nature of corruption? What are the connections to money laundering? and international crime. Is, is the real estate profession corrupt? Corrupt. We couldn't talk about it. We couldn't go there. We couldn't open that door to potential issues and charges of racism. The political class didn't know how to talk about it and didn't want to talk about it. They didn't even want to know about it. Andy, you know, Andy Yan, did a remarkable job because he simply found data that they should have known and didn't want to have. And so they put off a dialogue, a discussion, a debate that was absolutely critical to something that is so fundamental about this city. Can we talk to each other and deal with these difficult transformative issues? And in this case, it turned out that we couldn't. Now, we still can. And to me, 
that issue is the one, and is now going to be number one. And when we come back here next year, whether it's us or someone else, I think that's going to be the question that we will say is no longer off the table because it will be so obviously on. Thank you all so much. That was a great start to our evening, and there's a, there, I have so many questions, and I know you do as well, and I know you do as well, so I'm just going to ask one to, to get us started. Um, and that I would like to thank um, a couple of you for also highlighting what you think is missing from this list. I think it's an interesting contemplation, uh, the, the idea of kind of social policy and social planning versus kind of the, tradi the traditional notion of planning um, and how those intersect and, and where they, um, where milestones may land. But I'd like to uh, invite uh, Melody or Paul to highlight, was there anything not on this list that you would have thought should have been on here for 2017? Well, I think I've alluded to uh, one. I, uh, I really do think the childcare piece uh, is a significant issue for our city. Um, and I referred to a, a, an instance of a theme that I think needs to be on the list going forward, and I'm gonna pick up on Adrian Carr's uh, observations in a moment. But I, I talked about, you know, how does a city, how does a community, a province, like, how do we raise revenue? And I think one of the most fabulous thing that the environmental movement has done for us over the last couple of decades is it's routinely encouraged us to say, hey, let's raise our revenue by taxing things we don't want more of and potentially tax less what we do want more of. That's not really the Canadian way or the way actually of a lot of Western industrialized countries. We tend to tax a lot of income. Uh, and and we, that kind of drives our thinking about inequality. But this notion of you know housing wealth has gone up quite a lot. We tax that relatively in limited ways, especially at our senior levels of government. That's an instance of where we might want to tax less income and tax something we don't want so much high home prices. And I would say what's not on this list is sort of that theme more generally. Because if we're going to be talking about apocalypse, we're a coastal city. Less than one quarter of 1% of all of the revenue that Canadians generate for our governments comes from taxing carbon. Given that that probably is the greatest, global, greatest threat to population health anywhere on the planet, the lack of a conversation about the city's role in pricing pollution and then encouraging our senior levels of government to do that, in my mind, is an ongoing omission. Something that's been on my mind over the last week has been Northeast Falls Creek. I know the decision is on February 13th, but the planning process has been extended uh, all last year. And this is significant for Vancouver because I believe it's about 10% of the la land mass of, of Vancouver and um, it's the last waterfront land that we have. And for me, the most significant portion of Northeast Falls Creek is that our view cones might be damaged. One significant view cone from City Hall, from CAMI, and I think 10th or 12th. There's a proposal to put three towers um, that would penetrate that view cone. And once we lose those views, we will never get those views back again. It's an irreversible change. I believe three planning directors came out to say, no, you guys have to say no to the developers. You can't do this. They defended these view cones rigorously before I was even born so that I was able to enjoy these views. And now you know, there is a possibility that we will set precedent for these view cones to be damaged. So yeah, Northeast Falls Creek, maybe it will go on for 2018 milestone, but because the majority of the planning process happened last year, uh, right now it's top of mind for me. 
Thank you. I think I maybe will just ask two more. Uri, um, you, you started your comments of, around the, um, the fentanyl crisis, and you, know, you mentioned the, the, the need for more drug reduction sites. I'm just wondering, um, could you speak a little bit further as to what else you'd like to see from a planning perspective or what you think we should be thinking about as a city, as a community? Last summer, when I took my children um, to Crosstown Commons, um, the elementary school, the new playground had just opened. And there was um, a parks board staff member standing like a lifeguard watching the park. And that person's job was to make sure that there were no needles in the playground. And they were there constantly. So this, this idea that it's not a planning issue, it's actually costing our city a lot of money. We had to, we, we paid for that person to stand there and watch the playground to make sure that the kids weren't getting poked with needles because there were so many needles in that area. So, so how are we gonna deal with these needles? How do, we, how do we create disposal systems across our city that find safe ways to dispose of the needles? If people are using needles everywhere, then why don't we have systems? Why don't we have garbage cans that, that have safe disposal sites throughout our city? So it's not just places where people can, can use drugs in a harm reduction manner, but also so that, they can, so that they can make sure that they're disposing of their paraphernalia in a safe way that's not affecting the rest of the community. And then how do we develop resiliency in this area? I don't, I don't really know. I'm not a health expert. Um, I'm not a drug user. Um, but but we, have to, we have to open this conversation. We're talking about resiliency in many different areas. Um, we should be thinking about it from a resiliency perspective as well. How do we make sure that our young children aren't becoming drug users? This is a resiliency issue. This is forward thinking. Um, how do, we, how do we make sure it doesn't get worse? It got so bad this last year. It's, it's unacceptable, the levels that it got to. So how do we make sure it doesn't get worse? I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Um, but I do think that it, it is a significant planning Well, and you've issue. raised some important questions. Thank you. And Gord, I, the one word I did not expect to hear tonight at all was apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> and and, I, you, <laughs> and your, your question around dialogue and the importance of having some of these difficult conversations, one of the things that I've been reflecting uh, a lot on over the last year or two as I've watched, uh, as I've watched the evolution of public discourse and public dialogue um, in the digital era and what seems to me is a breakdown in civility and a breakdown in an ability to, to, sh to, um, to appreciate and explore different and diverse opinions. In some of these really heated emotional um, civic issues, do you think we're capable of, of, of coming together as a community with diverse opinions, diverse interests, and diverse values. Oh my gosh, we do it all the time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've got. Oh, I don't have good. to tell our yeah, yeah. <laughs> chief librarian. Yeah. How much programming do you do in this area? Well, yeah, we do a lot. You um, do a lot. At the same time, you know, we tend to bring people that have similar perspectives and similar values. It just we we as human beings we we tend to gravitate toward those who agree with us. Yes. And um, in some of, I'm just wondering if you have any advice from your current work as the city moves forward, how can we ensure that we are bringing these diverse perspectives forward? Oh, use the tried and true yeah. mechanisms yeah. that we've been doing for decades. We're really good at it. Okay. Oh yeah, all we right. do it all the so time. The same stuff. Yeah, good. absolutely. All right. Uh, okay. So if you've got an issue that you think is complex, involves multiple constituencies, mm -hmm. then you bring together some of the key leaders in the community and say, go at it. Uh, okay. Report out. Uh, we'll have a general discussion. Council yeah. will consider it. Recommendations will follow. Okay. Right. Actions will be taken. Okay. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. Sometimes brilliantly. Okay. You've got a pretty good record. Okay. Ta -da. Okay. That's perfect. Thanks. I can take this opportunity though to yeah. say, having introduced apocalypse and corruption and a few other <laughs> heavies into it, I, I didn't get a chance to touch on the one really key thing that, to me, in 2017, didn't constitute anything transformative, but was really a reflection of what happens when you do make transformative of decisions, and they can go back decades, and in our case, shocking to hear that we passed few cones before you were born, <laughs> and the same was true for the transportation priorities. We established that list. Uh, many cities have it now. Our priorities will be walking, cycling, transit, car, and out of that has come the Burrard Bridge. 
And the Bard Bridge is a spectacular success. This is of international significance. The achievement of what we did, that we were prepared to fund it, that we had the staff to do it, that the council held firm over time, that is a remarkable achievement. And I regret to say that it isn't recognized as such. Because if we don't celebrate our successes, and we concentrate on the deficiencies and the failures and the inadequacies. The result, in my political opinion and somewhat of my age, isn't that we double down on trying to address them, that we make a greater commitment to trying to solve our problems. Instead, we increase cynicism. We confirm in people's minds that government is incompetent and the bureaucrats don't know what they're doing. Repeat, repeat, repeat. God has proven to be an effective strategy. And this, if we don't celebrate, oh my gosh, we actually did something and it, it mostly worked. Or, we, or the city is better now because of this. Then we deserve that cynicism. Because how do you expect people to have faith when they don't see the benefits of the decisions that we and previous generations made? Thanks for the opportunity to get that in. <laughs> <Right>. Okay, before, <laughs> uh, before I invite uh, the audience to ask questions or comment, I would like to give the panelists an opportunity to question each other. So if you have anything that is just burning or on your minds as you were, and you'd like to, to comment on or ask, now's your moment. Gosh, I have so many. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that we're here today with different views too uh, constitutes productive dialogue. I think the first one I want to respond to is the 105 Kiefer DP, of course. Um, I know when that decision was made, I had to hop onto an airplane uh, two hours later. When I got off the airplane, checked my um, phone, the development industry was like, the sky is falling, this is the end, this is the end of the trust in the city. And I checked the sky when I was on the airplane, and it was still there, <laughs> right? The real estate industry is still going strong, and things are still going on, even in Chinatown. Some say that it was a politicized event, but at the same time, most of our councillors are not even running for council again. I think about 70% of them. Uh, the reason that the DP board gave was that the design did not meet the standards for the site. It is such a key site in Chinatown because it is on a gateway site. It is surrounded by this density of cultural assets, such as the Chinese Cultural Center and the Military Museum, the memorial to Chinese veterans and um, uh, railway workers, um, the Sun Yat-sen Gardens, historic Pender. There's, I believe there's no other site in any North American Chinatown that is as culturally sensitive and as important as a gateway site than 105 Kiefer. And what we got through the process of five years was an applicant that did not fundamentally shift their design or respond to the community and what the community was telling them. What we got at the end for the development permit uh, was a design where the the developer decided to paint the door red right, and call it a day and say, if I paint the door red, it must be Chinatown character. No, it's not. In fact, we made a documentary explaining why you can't just paint it red, and that documentary is called Paint It Red. I think we need to rethink how we design in heritage areas in Vancouver, that developers are no longer developing on brownfield or greenfield sites. They now have to develop in heritage and cultural areas with long-lasting communities and existing businesses and residents. And they'll have to deal with us. And they have to deal with us genuinely, not in a conquer and divisive strategy and definitely not painting a door red. 
right after the DP permit, I actually went to Barcelona. It was my first time. And I was just so in awe in how the architects there are able to incorporate new contemporary takes on, um, on heritage within heritage areas, just side by side. But we haven't had the ability to do that yet in Vancouver. Um, and I think that the DP board's decision maybe as a signal to say we need to hold ourselves um, in Vancouver to a higher standard of design, to realize that we're not just designing for a site, um, that we need to think about the context of where we are designing and stop appropriating culture, but really appreciate it. Um, as for a question, I thought it was really interesting that you brought up the fentanyl crisis and the fact that it wasn't in the milestone because Gord brought up the Burrard Street Bridge and a big part of the Burrard Street Bridge was that uh, we had the uh, suicide barriers and a lot of the discussions online went really dark really quickly uh, because of the suicide barriers. And some people say, well, it's a waste of money. It should be allocated to mental health instead. So there was a discussion of health. And I find it really interesting that um, in that regard, that was a milestone. Um, but when it came to the fentanyl crisis, it wasn't. That's just an observation. I don't know where to start. <laughs> um, I think going back to your comments um, about uh, 105 Kiefer and um, the need in the city to have a higher standard of design is a really um, is a really good observation. Um, if we look at if we look at how towers are built in our city and the kind of density that they have and the quality of um, the condos that are being built currently. They're not, they're not designed for families. They're not designed to last a long time. Um, a window wall system is a really inefficient system. It lets off, it lets off lots of energy, but it's, it's, it's the majority of what you see throughout our city. The, the city of glass is a window wall system. It, it's not sustainable in, from an environmental perspective. It's not providing quality design um, and the bottom line is the developers, um, how the developers are lining their pocket. It's not about good design. And I think maybe some light at the end of the tunnel is some of the strategies around how to change housing and how to change the housing mix um, in these developer um, projects that might address, um, that might address you know, long-term housing for families, for people, um, to make our city more livable. And I think if we change our value system, then maybe we'll we'll be able to achieve better design. Um, and I don't I don't think focusing on the character retention of single-family dwellings from 1940s is really going to get us there. I, I don't think that one's really a great. Um, I, I, I don't think that one deserves to be on our list. <laughs> I'm going to dodge the last comment, but I'm going to uh, dive into uh, an equally uh, controversial space. Uh, and I want to engage with Millie. I'm not sure I have a question or a response or a dialogue. And I'm going to preface it by saying, on any given day, uh, different nasty emails will be sent to me, sometimes calling me a shallow capitalist because I do encourage a lot. I do encourage density in land already zoned for residences, and I think supply is a big part of it. And other times, I get you know critique for being a, a, a crazy socialist because I actually think we should tax wealth differently. And and I when that happens on the same day, I tend to feel like okay, I'm I'm, I'm like charting the right course. I've got you know, somewhere. I'm probably in the middle, and that's where I want to be. So in my world, when I think on the supply side of the equation, my, the challenge I face, I think Gord's maybe referred to it earlier, is like people don't want to change our neighborhoods. 
people are content with a vision of our communities having low density. It's partly what attracted them there. They loved raising their kids there. And then I can point out, but your kids can't afford to live where you raised them now. The only way that may change is if we change our neighborhoods. We need to be building more density, not just in land that's currently zoned for, for agriculture, because wait for it, we need to grow food. And not just in land where we uh, actually get, currently have it zoned for industry, because wait for it, we need jobs. So if we actually have land now that's currently being underutilized where it's zoned for residences, in my view, that is a place where we need to focus our attention. And then there's Melody, and I'm learning a lot today. Because Melody, you inspire the heck out of me every time I see you on stage and hear you on the radio, because you remind us all, and this is a message I routinely have to say to our demographic and Gen Squeeze, Canadians, our 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the kids we're raising, politics responds to those who organize and show up. And we're actually not very good at doing that. We're less likely to cast a ballot on voting day. And more importantly, in my mind, we're less likely to like, organize in advance of elections to shape platforms or to show up at important decision-making moments, except in, you know, in terms of 105 Keeper, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. We did show up. We actually made a change that, in all honesty, I never thought would be possible because, in fact, it was you know, kind of going against the rules that had been legislated. And in many respects, the developers actually abided by the rules. That was what was so fascinating about this decision, is that even still, politics responded to those who organized and showed up. And so I guess my question, Melody, is how do we tap into that and the power that you mobilized that day? Because that inspired the heck out of me. And yet, marshal that power at certain moments to resist nimbyism in other places where actually that nimbyism is going to be inappropriate. There's a really delicate balance right now going on, and yet that is, I think, going to be at the epicenter of one big part of our city's transformation into the future so that it is sustainable for a younger demographic today and the kids we want to raise. And, and I guess we have to have conversations about, look, what are our top priorities? Is it a view corridor? Is it actually being able to live and afford to live closer to where I work or study? Is it you know, somehow having a, a park there so I, don't, I have to raise my kid on a balcony, but there's some kind of green space I can get to? These are the things like we need, we need to change. Mm -hmm. And most of the political resistance that's going to come forth in the, few, in the forthcoming years is going to resist that change. And it's going to take talented people, including on this space right here, right now, to think about how do we mobilize those people to support the change we want to see, and I guess, in some instances, resist what we don't. That was a badly asked question. I'm going to make sure my question the end, but there's, a, there's just something really powerful about what Melody has put out on it, and the 105 Kiefer is a fundamentally important moment, regardless of what you think about the decision. I agree. I would not ask a medical health officer to design suicide barriers on a built structure of the complexity of the Burrard Bridge. Nor would I ask a land use planner to come up with a strategy to deal with the fentanyl crisis. That's not what they're trained for. That's not what they're competent about. They may have a role that comes into play. Yes, I love kind of the idea. If you want to establish um, safe injection sites where? and where you have to plan for that, you do. then it's appropriate. But to ask them to be the strategic thinkers about something for which they are not trained, nor is their designated job, that will get you in trouble. Just as it will if you have a politicized process that the politicians aren't involved. As I said, in the Development Permit Board case, as it was clear that this was a critical political decision, send it to the politicians. If you push a bureaucratic structure, a legal structure, you can break it, and it will be very difficult to repair, particularly if there's a more appropriate place, a political place, for these decisions to be hashed out. Discussion, that's the job of the ECPC. That's the job of the community. Decision, particularly around policy, that's the job of council. And where's the role in that for, for advocacy and for pushing for change and for having decisions be made in a different way? In so many places. Uh, here, media, before council, advisory committees, uh, the group you create, uh, actions that you take, protests in the street, Advocacy can take a multitude of ways. And in our society, fortunately, uh, we're free to do them all. I think in response to Paul's question about activating 
a younger generation or just anybody, I think, across generations. Um, it's hard. It's difficult. I've been honing my skills for the last five years on all different topics from coding and now Chinatown to get to this point. And it's not just me. I'm only one person who is just extremely loud online and in the media. Um, I'm only one person. It took an entire community that rose up and said, this is it. This is the end. We can't bear to see our culture erased, and we need to put a stop to it. And that galvanized people left, right, and center. And not just Chinatown people, but a wider public. And I saw the public discourse really change from, oh, you know, Chinatown is a derelict neighborhood, um, it's just a parking lot, to, to now more of, well, maybe we need to think about what Chinatown means in Vancouver and that it's very important. Um, and it mobilized, you know, I get emails from people from even Victoria saying Chinatown is important. Um, so it takes more than just one person. Um, and it's an entire community, especially one that is resilient. And I wanted to use that word resilience because I don't think it's about the apocalypse when it's resiliency. Um, I went to the resilient conference that I believe VPC hosted, and everybody just kept on saying, well, resiliency, that means we need to protect ourselves from earthquakes and climate change, rising sea levels. And that's the number one thing we think about in Vancouver when we think about resiliency. And it's this kind of prepper culture, um, very much engineering focus that you have one or a few states that you bounce back on. But Resiliency is more than just earthquakes. Resiliency is more than just the environment. It is also social resiliency, cultural resiliency, economical resiliency, like our affordability crisis and the ability to be resilient, uh, resilient against that. Um, and then I, I have a question for Paul and maybe even Gord too, in terms of, I guess single family home zoning or single detached zoning. I like to call it low density. I don't like to use the word single family homes. Um, even though I recognize that it is in the zoning bylaws, I could have a whole other discussion on that. Uh, I guess my discussion, my question is, you know, when we do unleash more options and more options in terms of forms in these neighborhoods. Who are we creating the supply for? Can people actually afford to live um, even if the single detached homes become duplexes or row houses or townhouses? Because I'm seeing Grandview Woodlands and I, I saw a brochure for a townhouse and actually I did a search for townhouses in the east side and it was 1.3 million dollars for a townhouse so who's who are we building the supply for and can we actually depend on the real estate industry to build us out of this affordability crisis or is the real estate industry their priority is their shareholders and themselves first okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In 1976, when my mom was a young woman in this city, God, I hope I read the stat right, I believe there were around 22 million Canadians. We were less likely to live in urban centers. You flash forward to today, we have more than 36 million Canadians, and we are more likely to live in our urban centers. So when we ask, who are we building homes for? If we think we can dodge the question by simply saying, oh, the real estate that we're building is, you know, is only, the problem's only from some offshore person, that's dodging up a more complicated story. The reality is we're building homes for ourselves. We are, our, our population has- no, can't afford it, come on. Oh, okay, no, 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 I'm, okay, let's- I'll, just, You'll be our first, wow. you'll be our first, yeah, I will. I'm gonna let, yeah, Paul will uh, respond and then I'll turn it to the audience, thank you. So we need to be, so we need to be mindful that the fundamentals of our population have changed. More people 
yeah. in more urban space, in our urban spaces, that's changing our own in Canada demand. And our own Canada supply, it's, it's an open question whether or not it's kept pace. Do we want to be changing our neighborhoods so that you know, the next unit we build comes in at 1.2 million for a one bedroom place? No, that's not going to solve the problem for a generation squeeze. When we, one of our uh, concerns about the Housing Vancouver strategy is like, where are you actually monitoring the proportion of homes that are coming in under half a million dollars and provide access to more than two bedrooms? Because a generation ago, when my mom was a young woman, half a million dollars would have bought you two entire homes, more often than not, a house with a yard. Today, it barely buys you two bedrooms. And most of the people in this city are giving up on home ownership and we're renters. And so, yes, we need to think about in those places right now that are single detached homes where the land is costing a couple million dollars, it might be worth actually asking ourselves, what are the number of units we would need to build on that land to actually build units that are in reach for what typical younger people earn today and simultaneously put that in place with uh, changes to policy around taxation and other tools that limit harmful demand. And harmful demand would include demand by people who do not reside or work here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn things over to the... Yeah, get things started.